Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, for those of you who I've not yet met, my name is Melissa Giller. I'm the Director of Communications for the Reagan Foundation. Before we get started, in honor of our men and women in uniform who defend our freedom around the world, if you could please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So I had the privilege of meeting our speaker today back in August of 2002, when Air Force One tail number 27,000 was decommissioned from the Air Force in 2001, the Reagan Foundation was fortunate enough to be able to accept the historic aircraft for permanent display at the Reagan Library. As you know, this plane's now currently in our Air Force One pavilion. But getting the plane was just the beginning. We need the plane's walls to speak to us. So how could we do that better than to go to the experts? So on August 19th and August 20th of 2002, we assembled the experts. They included Colonel Bob Ruddick, the plane's pilot, Mr. Jerry Parr, President Reagan's chief of security, Mr. John Haig and Mr. Charlie Palmer, his chief stewards, and our speaker here today, Ken Walsh. The meeting's purpose was to detail specific stories about President Reagan's time on board Air Force One. And the team of expert, experts provided just that, as guests can see when they tour through the pavilion and the plane. But Ken isn't just an expert on Air Force One. He has covered the White House for US News and World Report since 1986, making him one of the longest serving White House correspondents in history. He has written numerous books on the presidency, including a book on presidential retreats, a book on Air Force One, a book on President Reagan, and even a book on the White House versus the press. In his latest book, Prisoners of the White House, Ken examines how the White House is becoming so removed from everyday life that isolation is becoming one of the most serious dilemmas facing the American presidency today. He is here with us to talk about this issue and the ways in which a president can break through the isolation bubble. Let's bring Ken up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, you all, for coming. Um, I. Uh, I want to also acknowledge my wife, Barkley, who's here, who's my researcher on all my books. So she's the essential element in making all this happen. Um, I wanted to uh, not only talk about this notion of prisoners of the White House, how presidents get isolated. I'll also show you some images and some scenes that people don't generally get to see from inside the White House that I think you'll be interested in. So that's always a, I think a fun part for me to sort of bring you in the footsteps of the presidents in many ways. But when I first started covering the White House back in 1986, <clears throat> I walked through the Northwest Gate, which is the gate we go through in the media and a lot of visitors go through. And always, uh, right from the beginning, it struck me how abnormal the life of a president is because a president uh, really doesn't live the way you and I live. A president has everything basically done for him. He has, uh, it's almost like an imperial life. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And um, you wonder how a president can really stay connected to the country when the president's life is so, uh, is so abnormal. And about 40 years ago, George Reedy, who was Lyndon Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson, one of his senior advisors, wrote a book called Twilight of the Presidency, in which he talked about this notion of unreality, <clears throat> how presidents have such difficulty uh, connecting with reality. And so I'm, in some ways, updating that notion. And in, in many ways, things are actually worse today than they were um, back then under Lyndon Johnson's times. I hope you can see these two monitors here. Uh, this was uh, President Obama's inauguration back in January of 2009. Uh, just as an example of sort of more of the positive sides of the president's life. Uh, this, usually a president gets maybe 150,000 or so, 200,000 people. But if you look at this image, you can see that the crowd went not only to the Washington Monument, the obelisk in the middle of the mall, but all the way back to the Lincoln Memorial. There's maybe a half a million people there. There was a sense of great jubilation in the country <clears throat> that the country had le elected its first African-American president. And even a lot of President Obama's critics told me at the time they did feel that they were proud that the country had perhaps moved beyond our history of slavery and segregation and prejudice and now had an African-American president. Now, I'll leave it to you to decide how far away we've gotten from that sort of race uh, issue in our country today. I don't think we've gotten as far as we hope to be, but basically um, there was a lot of hope, and that's one positive side of a, of a president's service, and that's the idea of uh, 
the adulation that presidents get. President Obama, very popular, especially initially, he had a, a sense of charisma about him, um, was able to uh, bond with a lot of people, very popular among young people, new voters, and so on. Another sort of positive part of the presidency. Also, of course, the idea of shaping history. Um, here you see President Obama giving a talk to a joint session of Congress, uh, which is another important part of the president's life. Um, the pre this is a wonderful picture in the White House. I always like to show, it just shows the, the, the history, the change in our country, the arc of history. George Washington, who actually had slaves in the White House, and President Obama today, uh, you know, our 44th president, um, and how much has changed in that whole dynamic of race in our country. So the idea of making history is very important uh, for presidents. Uh, of, of the perks, of course, this is, uh, as we just heard, <laughs> Air Force One. Uh, every president that I've covered, and I've covered five presidents now, they always say that the thing they miss most about <laughs> being president is Air Force One because it's a wonderful way to fly as you've gone through it today and we've just had a wonderful tour and gone through the plane. I used to travel on that plane so it was very nostalgic for me to see the seat I used to sit in and that sort of thing. Uh, but presidents really miss it because of course Air Force One this is the subject of a whole other lecture of course. Uh, the president uh, never has to wait, never has to check in at airports. Uh, the air, all the airfields are cleared for the president. A, a swath of the uh, of about two miles is cleared for the president in the sky when the president flies. So they all miss Air Force One, and you can see that when you went through the plane today. The new plane, not new anymore, but the, the latest plane is much bigger than the one you see here. But you can at least get a sense of what special uh, arrangements are made for the president when the president flies. Uh, this is Camp David. The president has this exclusive resort up in the Catoctin Mountains of Maryland, which the president gets to use exclusively if the president wants. Sometimes you can have other people there, but basically presidents love this. It's like a like their own pr private resort they can use. But it's also part of the whole isolation of the presidency because it's something that most Americans don't have, this kind of wonderful retreat with a staff designed to follow every whim of every president. Uh, the White House um, itself has wonderful perks in the White House. Um, this one picture, this is one of the scenes that people don't generally get to see. This is the family theater in the White House. Uh, the president can see first run movies there. This is President Obama and his wife Michelle watching the movie Avatar in 3D. I'm sure most many of you have seen that. Uh, I've been in this theater. It's a wonderful perk of office that presidents have. They have a wonderful staff at the White House that's designed to uh, do really everything that a president might want. Um, this is a scene where one of the butlers in the White House is giving the president a hot towel, uh, excuse me, a cold towel to cool him off after a, uh, an event. Uh, very devoted staff at the White House, something that, again, part of that layer of unreality. You know, maybe millionaires and billionaires have this kind of staff, but our president is supposed to represent us, and it's another step away from everyday life for presidents. Um, on the more negative side, of course, uh, those of you who have just gone through the exhibits here, this is the ultimate negative part of being president, is the security problems. This is President Reagan, and you've seen the, uh, the exhibit here on his, the assassination attempt. This is when they were pushing him in the car uh, after he was shot. Uh, at this moment, uh, President Reagan didn't th think he had been shot. The, the uh, bullet ricocheted off the side of the car, and a fragment hit him in the ribs, came close to his heart. He didn't realize he'd been shot. When he got in the car, he was pushed in very roughly just to get him out of there. Um, he thought one of the agents had broken one of his ribs. And he said, well, well you know, you, you've broken one of my ribs. Is this really necessary? They got to the hospital. And uh, he insisted being, uh, wanting to live up to the idea of a, the stature and dignity of the president. He insisted on getting out of the limousine, but pulling up his trousers, buttoning his jacket, and walking into the hospital to show that he was not really badly hurt, that he collapsed and he, he did almost die. But that was President Reagan's uh, way of handling this. But the point of it in context of this talk is the idea of presidential security. Always uh, uppermost on the minds of people at the White House. Every time there's an incident at the White House, and again, I've covered the White House for 27 years, there's always uh, an increase in security, whether it's the assassination of President Kennedy. Of course, we're coming up on the anniversary of that a week from Friday. Um, the attempted assassination of President Reagan, um, other security issues such as the 9-11 attacks, security goes up and up and up and it never goes back to the way it was before. This is part of the isolation once again. If the president was here, 
you wonder what kind of human interaction he could have either here or anywhere else. There would be Secret Service agents on either side of the podium, all around the room, behind the curtains, in the hall. There would be plainclothes Secret Service agents in this group. And uh, it gets to be very intimidating for people. So you wonder if people, even his staff, even the president's staff, can a president really get a candid view of what's going on and how his policies are being, being affecting people in this kind of an environment. Um, Another uh, aspect of this is the president's decisions causing personal trauma to the president himself. This is Lyndon Johnson, who was president during the Vietnam War. This is a very, uh, very poignant picture, really, of Lyndon Johnson. In listening to a tape recorder, you can see at the lower right hand of that picture a reel-to-reel -reel old style tape recorder. This was his son-in-law, Chuck Robb, who later became governor of Virginia and senator from Virginia, who was a combat soldier in Vietnam. He sent back this tape to tell his father-in-law what was really going on there. And of course, Lyndon Johnson was really grief-stricken to think his policies were not working as well as he wanted. His son-in-law was in danger. Son-in-law came back safely, but it's just an example of the, the burdens of office that a president has to deal with and how difficult this is and how this actually leads to the isolation of the presidents also. Um, the um, privacy at the White House. Now, this is a wonderful picture. Uh, just take a look at this. Uh, the other side of all the staff and all the people trying to help the president is the lack of privacy. This is President Obama and, his, and the First Lady Michelle in a freight elevator. Presidents travel often in freight elevators because they're more secure. And all those people in the, along the wall are Secret Service agents. Look at their, they're not, they don't want to look at the president, uh, Mrs. Cl uh, Obama, because there's a private moment going on here. So look, one of them is looking at notes, they're looking off to the side, just to give them this moment of almost intimacy. But this is what presidents object to many times because they don't get this time to themselves or time with their spouses as much as they want. And I think this is a picture that illustrates that. Uh, when a president goes to any part of the White House, part of the pri privacy problem again is uh, you get this whole notion of the staff waiting for you. What can we do for you, Mr. President? Everywhere they go. I remember when President Clinton took over, he was in the residence of the White House and he got up at 2 o'clock in the morning to make himself a sandwich and there was a butler and a Secret Service agent waiting in the kitchen. He said, well, why are you here? This is the most protected building in the world, probably. Um, and they said, well, this is the way we've always done it. So he said, well, I'd like to have some time to myself. I don't want you to hear all the time. So they cleared the third residential floor out of Secret Service so that he could have some private time. But it does get to be a burden, especially to younger presidents who want to be active, want to get out around town, and the Secret Service is always limiting them. So again, it's a real challenge to uh, presidents to have this privacy. Now, I'm going to run through some presidents and how they dealt with this isolation issue and show you some of the more of these images that I think you'll be interested in. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was one of our, our, our iconic leaders. and. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, his wife, was a tremendous asset to him. President Roosevelt had his legs paralyzed from polio, and he couldn't get around the country as he wanted to do, so he had his wife, Eleanor, do this for him, and she served as what she called his eyes and ears. And so she went out around the country, she talked to a lot of people, and she reported back to her husband. She did things that other first ladies uh, never did. It was really unheard of. She went to uh, migrant labor camps. She went to the inner cities. She went to uh, uh, farm fields. Uh, she went down to the coal mines of Pennsylvania. This is a picture of her after she'd gone into the coal mine, down the coal shaft, the mine shaft, dressed as a coal miner. Uh, and uh, this caused a huge stir because people thought, well, maybe the First Lady should not be doing this. But Franklin Roosevelt felt that it was necessary to help keep him informed about what was going on in the country. And he really valued this uh, way of keeping in contact with people that the First Lady provided. This is one thing that I learned in doing the book. My wife Barkley reminds me of this all the time, that for anybody who's doing much of anything, listen to your spouse. <laughs> and the President should do that too, because the First Ladies often will tell the Presidents things that nobody else will tell them. And uh, this is something that I think Presidents learn when they make the mistake of not listening to their spouses in particular. Um, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was able to bond with the country in many ways. Um, one way he'd learned how to do this in the fireside chats, he talked to the country on the radio directly. This was very important at the time, mastering the medium of the radio. Also, as I mentioned, he was paralyzed by polio, and he um, 
tried all his adult life to recover from this. He was never able to do it. Uh, at one point, he discovered a home in Warm Springs, Georgia, for uh, essentially children trying to recover from polio. He bought it, trying to take the therapy there. You may, you've probably seen the movie Warm Springs, starring Kenneth Branagh, which uh, rec recreates some of this. But uh, what President Roosevelt did is he went down there as often as he could because the waters came out of the ground at 88 degrees at a constant temperature, it made him feel better. He'd do therapies in the pool and he'd play with the children and teach the children the therapy techniques, water sports and so on that worked for him. And he learned empathy there. And his wife, Eleanor, said that if he hadn't had the polio, as horrible as that was, he would not have been the empathetic person he turned out to be. And this is a picture of him at the pool, which you can still visit. I visited this. Uh, it's open to the public in Warm Springs. It's now used for treatment of people with spinal injuries as opposed to the polio clinic. But look at Roosevelt uh, in this picture. Look at his legs. Look at how uh, uh, withered his legs are, how uh, they're like, almost like sticks, upper body very strong. He never wanted the country to see him in this way because he felt he would look too vulnerable, but in Warm Springs he lowered his guard and allowed the people around him to see him there. And again, this is the point of empathy, how he stayed in touch with people because he understood the difficulty of struggle and perseverance. The children in Warm Springs didn't think of as President Roosevelt. They called him Doc Roosevelt because he was always trying to give them the therapies that worked for him. Um, as I said earlier, we're coming on this anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. This is an iconic picture of President Kennedy in the Oval Office. This has been taken to mean that he's burdened by the problems of office. Uh, this, people see this picture and they think he's got his head bowed. He's looking like he's, he's having struggles getting his decisions made. That's not at all what happened in this picture, by the way. Uh, he had a bad back. He was just standing there reading the paper. <laughs> the paper's on the table. That's all he's doing. But the photographer said he was a wonderful picture and he took it, but it's taken on all these other aspects of the wonderful illustration of the burdens of the presidency. That's not really what it is, but uh, it does give that sense of the burdens of the presidency that I thought I'd show you. One thing Kennedy did, and I've just written about this in US News in my column, is he did listen and learn. Many of our presidents don't do that. They come into office with certain ideas and they're inflexible, they don't adjust. President Kennedy did that. One of the ways he did that is on the civil rights movement. He came into office thinking he would be the president for uh, ending the Cold War or to fight fighting the Soviets. Uh, then he noticed this tremendous civil rights movement around the country. He respected physical bravery, having been a war hero in World War II, and he uh, respected the bravery he saw among the protesters. And so uh, as by the, uh, the summer of his final year in office, the summer of 63, uh, he was embracing the civil rights movement and he had civil rights leaders in the White House. More people, visit, African Americans visited the White House under Kennedy than had come there in under all presidents previously, total. And so um, he did listen and learn, and I think that's one important uh, lesson that we can draw from the Kennedy presidency, the idea of paying attention to what's going around you, paying on attention to the country and trying to adjust to it. We talked about Lyndon Johnson briefly. He followed up on Kennedy. He's signing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 here, carried out Kennedy's legacy. Uh, in the beginning, I think Johnson was connected to the country, but then he sort of lost the connection and the reason really was the Vietnam War, the tremendous protests. Uh, he stayed with his policy, escalating the war, thought he could convince the country to go along. It didn't happen that way. And by the end of his presidency, he didn't run for uh, another term and um, uh, probably would not have won. And um, he was isolated. He was so isolated that he was almost literally a prisoner of the White House because he couldn't speak virtually anywhere except on military bases where he was treated with respect as commander in chief or at conservative campuses um, because he would have virulent and often violent protests against the war. Today we talk about the lack of civility in our politics. I can remember in those days, do you remember the chant that would go up against Lyndon Johnson in, his, in the time of the Vietnam War? Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? So I think we have a way to go today to get to that level of uh, derision and um, mockery of a president, but that's really what Lyndon Johnson dealt with. Uh, president Nixon comes into office. Um, he was also very isolated uh, as well. Uh, he also had that problem as he escalated the Vietnam War himself. 
of not um, understanding the divisions in the country, the depth of the divisions, and uh, he also became something of a prisoner in the White House, uh, very isolated from the country, and of course, he had to resign uh, as the Watergate scandal, um, because partly because he was so, um, he got paranoid about things and went too far in uh, surveillance on his political adversaries and so on, but another case that I point out in the book of a president who uh, lost touch with the country. I will move rapidly here because I do want to get up to uh, particularly President Reagan and others. Now, this is an interesting picture, isn't it? <laughs> president Gerald Ford uh, succeeded Reagan in office. He was Reagan's vice president, had been a member of Congress. President Ford did try to reach out to people. His hairstyles were a bit different then, weren't they? Uh, those are the entertainers, Billy Preston and George Harrison, formerly of the Beatles. And um, G G President Ford tried to reach out to the entertainment industry, to young people, to African Americans, and so on. I found in one of the diaries he wrote to himself uh, that's his, at his library a very uh, point message. He said, you know, I tried to reach out. It's not making a difference, but no, pe Americans will never forgive me for being Richard Nixon's vice president, and that's true. So, of course, he loses his, uh, again, out of touch with the country in some ways, loses his contact with the country, loses to Jimmy Carter in 1976. This is Carter with Pat Cadell, his pollster. I use this as an illustration of one thing that, that uh, presidents do to try to keep in contact with his, with his polling. Now, Pat Cadell is on a TV commentator now. He looks a lot different now than he did then. <laughs> I'm not sure what his politics are. I think he's at the extreme where the left and right meet, somewhere out in the ether. But in any case, uh, what the problem with this situation is that Carter paid too much attention to the pollster. Uh, Pat Cadell was able to insinuate himself into many areas of the White House and captured Carter's mind as his brilliant forecaster of the future. Um, the best presidents understand that they can't just listen to the pollster. There has to be some counterweight, some way of balancing out what the pollster says. You can't be captured by the pollster. Jimmy Carter made the mistake of letting Cadell dominate a lot of his thoughts about the country. Cadell wrote this famous memo about how the country was in a crisis of confidence. Carter made what was called the malaise speech, talking about this. Didn't use the word malaise, but that's what he meant. And it became a symbol that Carter was blaming the country for his own faults in leadership. Uh, I'm not a partisan, and I'm not trying to take sides here, but this is really what happened to Carter, and um, it's just an example of being captured really by the polling operation. So now we'll talk about uh, where, we, where we are now at President Reagan's library. Uh, this is a picture that's actually here in one of the exhibits of Reagan as a lifeguard. One important part of Reagan's history is that he never forgot his middle class roots, and um, he was criticized as president for being too close to the wealthy and to being too close to, to uh, the corporations and so on. But he didn't forget his middle class roots in many ways. He remembered what he had learned as a young fellow. He, uh, as a lifeguard uh, here, and you've seen some of this in the exhibits, he, he never forgot the idea that some people need help sometimes, but he also felt that as a lifeguard, he said he saved 70 people's lives over, I guess, seven years in the summers as a lifeguard, something like that. But he also said that the, most of the people whose lives he saved resented it because they felt that they were being uh, embarrassed and they were being, they, that they, maybe they didn't even need the help, although, you know, some of them really did. They were drowning after all. Uh, but he never forgot that. He felt that people don't want handouts and help. Um, whether that was a correct conclusion, I'll leave you to decide. But this is the importance of, st of understanding your middle class roots if you have them and you go into the office of President, and President Reagan uh, didn't forget that. When he became president, I covered, as I say, Reagan in, in, starting in 86. He had a way of making people, people feel good about themselves. When I did the book about Air Force One, per, person after person, people on the plane, the pilots, the crew, the staff, people around him said he made them feel good about themselves, that things would be better. Uh, and he did that for the country, too. Again, not taking sides on this, but basically he did have a gift of optimism, which I think the country very much appreciated. How did he stay in contact? Well, in addition to understanding his roots, um, Reagan had an incredibly active uh, correspondence. You see books now, hundreds, thousands of letters he wrote and had written to him over the years. He responded many of them 
to many of them, it was a tremendous uh, effort on his part privately to stay in touch with everyday America, which I think he uh, really did try to do. Um, there was one particular incident I wanted to mention also where he uh, went to a school in Washington, D.C. and asked the principal to give him the name of a pen pal he could keep in contact with. They came up with the name of a precocious African-American student named Rudy Hines. Rudy Hines uh, corresponded with the president. The president corresponded to him. They, they, they got along really well, and so President Reagan um, had the Hines family over to the White House. He went to the Hines home privately, secretly really, in Washington, and they had dinner. This is a picture of one of the incidents where President Reagan and Mrs. Reagan are at the home of this uh, African-American family in Washington. I'm, I'm covering Reagan. I didn't know anything about this. We, none of us knew it at the time in the press corps. And there's little Rudy. You see him on the left side there. It looks like he's, they're having some dinner. The Reagans are eating off tray tables. I think they might be a little overdressed for the occasion, but whatever. And uh, Ron looks like he's really interested in whatever they're eating there on his tray table. But it was an interesting moment because people didn't expect this of Reagan. They didn't think he was trying to keep in contact with minorities and with African Americans, but he really did. And I think this is one case where that was borne out. Um, President Bush takes office. This is a famous case where President Bush also lost touch with the country. This is the famous scanner incident. President Bush went to a supermarket uh, exhibit where they showed a uh, scanner where you'd have your food, scan, the barcode scanned, and um, the, the media reported uh, based on the report of a pool, which is a little group of reporters that travels with the president all the time, that he didn't understand what a scanner was because he reacted with such amazement. But this was not a regular scanner. They tore up the barcode, threw it down on the screen, and it read the barcode, even though it was torn up, which I think most of us would have been surprised at at the time. And that's what he was expressing amazement at, not the scanner, but this ultra-sophisticated scanner. But this became a symbol that President Bush was out of touch. Uh, this and other things um, um, ca really caused a tremendous problem for him, and I think by the end of his presidency, he did become out of touch, uh, not because of the scanner, but because the country wanted a domestic agenda during a recession that President Bush uh, did not provide to the satisfaction of the country. Um, we'll move along another rapidly here. This is... Um, President Clinton um, at the colonnade at the White House. Uh, President Clinton did use many, many ways of keeping in contact with the, with the country. Polling, I uh, got out around the country as much as he could. He was very energized by people. He took interest in things that other presidents had not taken interest in, um, and um, such as the African American church. He was very interested in this. He would, uh, he would uh, go to African American churches, and um, he knew not only just the, the main um, uh, central um, part of a, of a spiritual, but he'd know the whole, whole thing and he'd be singing them. So he really did take pains to, to be in contact with everyday Americans and with pe parts of the country that uh, the, the other presidents had not been in contact with. So even though during that difficult impeachment year, um, he had a lot of difficulty. He was able, by the end of his presidency, to persuade people that the private character of the president, which they felt was flawed with Clinton, was not as important as the public leadership of the president and the policies. So he had people make that distinction. And so he was sensitive enough to what people wanted that he was able to accomplish that, which was very important at the time. President Bush comes in, Bush the son. I show you this picture of him with sort of the cowboy hat on because he had the reputation of saying, as he always said, I don't pay attention to polls. I make decisions based on what I think is right. He calls himself the decider. And um, he made some decisions that were very controversial, uh, not only after 9-11 and the war on terrorism, but the uh, war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan. And he felt that uh, he would do what was best. And if the country came along with it, fine. If not, he was just going to go his own way. And uh, so I think in many ways, President Bush uh, went too far with that as far as public opinion goes. But I'll leave you to decide whether the policies were correct. But he did, I think, fall out with the country in many ways. And that was borne out in the polls. Um, this is one other example of President Bush who uh, had a difficulty. Uh, let me see if I can get this to move here. Um, there we go. This is Hurricane Katrina, the famous picture the White House re released that pro they probably should not have released. He was at his home in his ranch in Texas during Hurricane Katrina, which devastated the Gulf Coast. Um, he was um, told that it was a terrible problem, but he, he, didn't, he ignored it. He was finally given, 
wasn't paying attention to the news reports and so on. Well, if I was given a, almost a reel, like a newsreel, of images compiled from television coverage to show the desperation people were going through after Katrina. So then he did cut his vacation short, but instead of visiting the sites or the rescue workers or so on, he just flew over it. And they released this picture of him looking out the window of Air Force One at the damage below. And so it looked like he was literally too distant from it. And it took him a very long time to address this. He ended up going to the site of Katrina many times after this, but his staff to this day says that this was a time when he lost touch with the country in the sense that people didn't think he was focused enough on everyday problems and the crises of everyday America, and he lost his reputation for management during Hurricane Katrina that he was not able to recover. So now we're up to the present time. Um, uh, there we go. President Obama. Uh, President Obama uses many, many techniques to stay in touch. This is him using his BlackBerry we first came into office, remember the BlackBerry is going out of fashion now, but he still uses it, actually. They, 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 the Secret Service didn't want him to, to use the BlackBerry because they were afraid the bad guys would, would hone in on it and know where he was and could track him. So now they put many security precautions in the BlackBerry system. So he does get messages from people around the country that his friends and so on. And I think this is good because um, he does is able to have contact with people uh, directly rather than going through the staff. And I think that's important for any president to have. He reads letters. I mentioned President Reagan getting letters. President Obama gets, they say, 40,000 emails and regular letters a day. And he gets 10 of them every night, and he reads them when he goes back to the residence. It's a big deal. Um, he does pay attention to the letters, and uh, he does read them. He often writes on them, asking people to follow up on this or that. I remember talking to his chief of staff, who said sometimes the letters are a pain because the president does want these uh, people uh, responded to. And uh, so the next morning, the letter, after the letter arrives and gets to the president, some farmer in Iowa gets calls from five White House senior staffers. How can we help you with your farm subsidies, Farmer Jones? Uh, and so it takes a lot of staff time to do this. But President Obama does feel he gets so, at least some sense of everyday life from the letters. Uh, he does uh, break out of Washington. This is him meeting a middle class family in Great Falls, Virginia. President Obama said that during his first term, uh, one of the mistakes he made was not breaking out of what he calls the White House bubble enough, getting out of Washington, getting around the country. Again, it's difficult when the president gets out in having a human interaction, as I said before, because of the security and other factors, but he does try, and I think that's uh, very important. I also wanted to mention here, before I take some questions, it's not just presidents who are isolated in Washington. Uh, this is Senator Reid and Senator McConnell, the two leaders of Democratic and Republican leaders of the Senate. A lot of people in polls are saying, well, look, the president's not just isolated, the people in Congress are isolated too, uh, they're in their own bubbles, and I think that's basically true. Um, and I must include my own profession, we in the media are also isolated in many ways in Washington, and so it's important to break out, frankly, and do stuff like this, talk to everyday folks out around the country, and I think that's very important for us in the media to do as well. And this is uh, another example of the full leadership of the House and Senate, um, of course, did not exactly cover themselves with glory in the recent government shutdown issue, but um, uh, this is part of the whole bubble of Washington that people are paying attention only to their little worlds and not the broader picture of the country as a whole. This is the, uh, another one of these iconic pictures of President Obama at the window of the White House. Um, uh, this is, uh, it's interesting because um, um, I think they were trying to recreate that Kennedy moment in some ways here. Um, and uh, I'd leave it to you to decide whether they succeeded, but it does indicate, I think, sort of the solitary nature of presidential leadership. Then finally, I, this is a wonderful picture that Bar my wife Barkley and I found of the president coming in to the south entrance of the White House looking toward that fortress-like building, um, which is um, what the White House too often becomes. I'll just leave you with the thought, um, this is not just a modern problem. Uh, President Harry Truman called the White House the Great White Jail. Uh, President Clinton called it the crown jewel of the federal penitentiary system. And uh, President Obama, of course, calls it the bubble. But I think it's one of the main problems of our presidents these days that the idea of being isolated from everyday life and reality, I think presidents have to work at it, work at it hard to avoid isolation. 
I think it can be done, but it has to be one of the main things that they try to do day in and day out. So with that, I'd be glad to take some questions. Yes. How do you think our campaign finance system isolates not only the president but Congress? I mean, most people can't donate a couple thousand dollars to a candidate all the time. It seems like if they have to spend all their time fundraising, they're hanging out with people that aren't normal people. That's true. Um, I think you heard the question about fundraising and how that causes presidents to hang out with people who are not normal people. <laughs> uh, uh, nice people, like our questioner says. Uh, but um, it's true. If you look at what members of Congress have to do, presidents have to do, President Obama is, is doing a round of fundraising right now in this current period. Uh, they have, you know, the, uh, President Obama uh, and any major presidential candidate, they often reject federal matching funds, which means the money that a lot of people contribute, check off on their tax returns, are put in a fund to spend on campaigns where the presidents can reject or accept that. In recent times, the successful nominees have rejected it because they can raise more privately. A billion dollars is the ticket now for getting into the White House. You have to raise a billion dollars to run on your campaign, so they have to be running, raising money all the time. And uh, just as an, an example of the difficulty, not only of hearing people, special pleaders and people who have their own agendas and so on, just the time uh, taken to raise money is enormous. And uh, I think that is isolating. Hanging out with the, with the contributors is isolating. Uh, this is an interesting thing of how presidents try to break out of When President Carter took office, he did try to break out of the isolation in some ways. Um, he went and stayed at the homes of people around the country, everyday people, so he could show he was trying to reach out and maybe pick up something about how people lived. As difficult as that was, you know, President, you know, President Carter's in my spare bedroom, so, you know, he's going to learn a lot about my life with 20 Secret Service agents all through the house. Well... But um, what happened to that is that um, President, got such, President Carter got such pressure from Democratic contributors, why doesn't he stay with us? <laughs> you know, we're the one giving him the money to win the elections. And he got such pressure to do that that he started to stay with the contributors and he stopped staying with the everyday people. Just so how difficult it is to break out of that tremendous fundraising cycle because the presidents need the money. The candidates need the money. So, and it is a big problem. So that was a very good question. Anybody else? Yes. Um, we know because in the White House gallery, in the White House gallery, there is a schedule from the minute the president wakes up, every five minutes, ten minutes, the right. schedule scheduled, um, and that was on the day of the attempted assassination. My question is, and I get it asked a lot, does the first lady also have a, a regimented schedule? And what about the children? Right. Well, well, all right. Well, the, the question is about the, the the programming of the days of the president, the first lady, and the children in the White House. Yeah, the president's schedule is unbelievably circumscribed. Uh, like like you say, five minute increments. Sometimes, um, you know, minute to minute increments uh, filled with events. Events the presidents generally, after a time, get to, to 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 hate because it takes so much time. It's tedious. Just as an example, we're coming up on Christmas and the holiday parties. The president will have to go through, and this has happened ever since I've covered the White House, um, maybe 20 holiday parties, plus a lot of other things. He'll be shaking hands with about, with about 30,000 people. Um, in addition to just the time constraints, um, it's just a terrible burden on the president, really, just to go through this, just standing there, you take, you're talking, there's five seconds per person, just the hands going by. So just an example of how filled the president's schedule tends to be. And uh, for the first lady, another good question. Yes, the, president, the first lady's schedule, depending on how busy the first lady wants to be, um, but it's not as required as it is for the president. It just depends on what the first lady wants to do. For instance, um, Jackie Kennedy did not have this moment-to-moment -moment schedule. She was able to get away. She didn't like Washington very much. She didn't like a lot of the public events, so she was able to get away to their estate out up to Hyannisport. She took trips with just with her staff and her family to Europe uh, while she was first lady. And, and so she didn't have that kind of a, a schedule because she didn't like it. And the President Kennedy decided, well, 
you know, okay, Jackie, if that's what you want, okay. He was, she was a tremendous asset to him in other ways. So it's really what the First Lady wants to do. The First Lady wants to be more, uh, have less of a schedule, the First Lady can do that. Many times the President can't because of the burdens of decisions and events. Now for the children and the families, that's another very good question because uh, it's a very, very um, bizarre life that these kids go through. And Malia and Sasha, as an example, President Obama's two daughters, um, they don't just go up to school with their book bags. They've got motorcade they got to get into. They got secret, age, secret service agents. They got uh, they show up in a big production. You know, some kids just don't want. I'm sure Malia and Sasha, you know, are sick of this by now. Uh, now we in the media have given been giving them a pass. We don't really focus a lot on them, and I think that's good. But um, it's uh, it's just very very difficult for presidential children to have a normal life. Uh, not only because of the spotlight, but because of the security and because, uh, you know, all kinds of other problems like jealousies among students and friends and so on. And uh, I admire presidents who, are try, who try to cocoon their children off, which, which President uh, Clinton tried to do, which uh, President Bush, the son, tried to do because his children are younger, and which President Obama tries to do. But it's very difficult for the kids, very difficult. So, yes. You bring up a really important uh, question here for not only the country but the president. But uh, my question would be in ref reference to resolving this or making progress, what is the role of the Secret Service and security for the president? It seemed to be that it is huge. And how yeah. can that be yeah, well, mediated a bit? Well, the Secret Service role is huge. Um, uh, presidents, um, uh, initially, if they, if they rebel against it, and some of them do, um, uh, tend to relent. In fact, they all, they all relent because they realize how dangerous the world is to them. President Obama gets more than an average number of, of death threats. They don't like to tell us a lot about this, but I, 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 I'm told that it's an, an enormous number of death threats he gets. First African-American president, controversial agenda, and so on. Um, you know, in his lifetime, we've had a president killed. We've had another president almost killed. General Ford had uh, assassin two assassination attempts against him that were unsuccessful. And so presidents tend to realize that they have to go through this security. They have to be protected. Um, and this causes a lot of uh, problems, not the least of which is just getting the president around is so expensive. Uh, traveling on Air Force One, it costs, I think it's about $140,000 an hour just for the fuel. And the president just can't get on a, a, a shuttle or just get on a plane uh, and go around the country. He's, that Air Force One is very well protected, so it costs an enormous amount of money. But presidents really have to live with it. I mean, they, they understand that they are in danger, and even if they rebel initially, they've always come around to the idea of the Secret Service wants it. That's the way it'll be. So, yes. I was... Um, I was taught politics by my big brother, and what he told me was that the president was basically a fall guy, because if when the cabinet members messes up, it all goes back to the president, because he's the one that hired them. So it's more of teamwork, because if one of the cabinet members messes up, he's the guy that's going to get blamed for it. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, uh, I think that's true. I think... Um um, but, you know, as Harry Truman said, the buck stops here. The president names the cabinet members. The president's in charge of the government. Um, whether it's fair or not, people expect the president to be accountable. And if, the, if a cabinet member messes up, the president gets blamed for it, and then the president has to decide whether the cabinet member gets fired or not. Sometimes they get fired and sometimes they don't. Kathleen Sebelius, uh, head of Health and Human, and Human Services now, is getting tremendous uh, criticism for this health care rollout that's been botched, and it has been botched. But President Obama hasn't fired her, but he's getting blamed for naming her. But that's the way, the, that is the way the system works. I mean, if you didn't have that accountability, then um, I think we'd be in more trouble than we're, than we're in, because the president is the guy who, who makes these decisions on who's serving in the government, and um, I think that accountability is important. So, anyone else? Thank you very much okay. for coming. It was a great speech. Loved the pictures. Thank you. Walked in history lane.